You need to do things in a logical order because going back and reworking is a killer. You need to make your decisions and have them all build on one another and just keep going. That doesn't mean that the design is affected. It's, it basically just saves you a lot of aggravation. Episode 151. This is the Business of Architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, you're missing out on the valuable, free, practice-building resources I share only via email. Getting on the list is simple. Visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the green Join Today button. I am your host, Enoch Sears. To get more profit or efficiency in your firm, check out this business tip from Peter Drucker. What's measured improves. Now, I found this to be so true, and as a firm owner, you must be tracking your financial key performance indicators. One of the easiest ways to do this is with a software application like ArchiOffice. Get a live walkthrough of the software by visiting ArchiOffice.com demo, and a big thank you to ArchiOffice for supporting this show. Today is the second half of my interview with architect and entrepreneur Rick Wolnicek. You'll learn what mistakes to avoid if you want to create a software application and three excellent tips for managing your architecture projects so you deliver on time and make a profit. Rick, Corbu is a software application and you invest a lot of time and energy, uh, even money, in getting this software application built. Let's talk about that process, about someone who might want to go into developing, they see a need and they want to develop a software application. What are some of the lessons that you learned from going through that process. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interest. I mean, I, that was interesting and enjoyable. It is amazingly like an architectural project, except that it's got a lot less to do with, um, the nuts and bolts stuff, you know, details that, that an architect creates. That's the, the programming side of it, but there's always going to be the part that you see and interface with and the user experience and all that, that, that is very architectural. It's just too, you know, graphic design. And, but thinking through what the process would be, uh, that was really kind of interesting uh, because the other two people on this team uh, had no idea what the heck architects did or how they really needed to keep their books. So I had to be able to, you know, spin that out for them and, and tell them how to do that. And in the beginning, um, they got me a piece of software called uh, balsamic, like the the uh, vinegar uh, salad dressing. Spelled a little different, but and uh, this is a, a graphic tool with a bunch of widgets that look like parts of a uh, a, a web page that you can drag and drop, size, move around, do things like that. And so I'm creating what the the uh, timekeeping, you know, data entry part should look like using something like that. Occasionally I did it by hand, but by and large I use that that tool. Um, that's that's kind of interesting. I mean, you know, I've thought that if I went back and resurrected Corbu, that what I would do is use that tool, Balsonic, and go through and create every page that you would come across in the website with a little commentary of what's going on there and then take that to different developers if they're having research who actually knows what they're doing. Another, the big thing that I, I have no clue about is what language would you write this all in? Um, I'm a big fan of 37 Signals and their Basecamp program and several others. They're all about Ruby, Ruby on Rails. I mean, they have developed part of it. Uh, those guys are, 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 you know, they're really interesting role models. And so, you know, my gut reaction is, oh, of course you do it on Ruby on Rails. I have no idea if Ruby can deal with a database like you've got in a bookkeeping system or not. So, you know, there's just a lot I would need to, to learn and anybody would need to learn to do that. But, you know, if you could hooked up with a, a programmer, or maybe you'd need to talk to several to find out what the consensus is or maybe get on some sort of uh, forum and ask the question, you know, what, what really works that way. Uh, the, so the, we, we got beyond that part and we actually had the programmer turning stuff out. 
he had the the a copy of the B two B software that he was working on in kind of a sandbox atmosphere. You know, it was under development. We could log on. We could make it do stuff. And um, you know, he, he was probably really good at behind the scenes programming. But the graphic stuff was was really painful to, to get him to understand what was going on and how it needed to work. You know, just as as one example, we were working on the the invoicing, and we were going to be able to drag, create text, and move it to wherever you wanted it and size it. And so I'm playing with that, and I cannot get this stuff to line up. You know, left right margin. You know, even across the page, I'm just having a nightmare of a time. And we've got a, a a grid that's kind of slowing things down. But you know, you really had to have the grid to even see just how much you're you're off. Well, after about literally three or four weeks of back and forth on this, we find out that everything I had ever touched has an insertion point in the lower left corner of a piece of text. Word works that way, you know. AutoCAD works that way. Every graphic program I've ever seen works that way. His insertion point was in the upper right corner. Now the problem with that is that if you resize that element, it it's locked on the upper right corner and it's dropped down. So you know, it was just. I mean, you literally had to eyeball it to see if if you were getting it where you wanted it. You know. If he knew more about graphics, you know, it was kind of like we were trying to design a, a high rise and said, let's do it out of wood frame because that's economical. Well, you know, every day you're going to find out a reason why that was a bad decision. So whatever tool he was using there, he needed to have found a different one. So was one was one lesson then working, you know, work with the right developer? Yeah, I think uh, you would need to find somebody. I mean. He knew a lot about this, and there was a lot of that we were talking about bringing a more graphic kind of guy in. But the guy spending the money, the, the owner of the B two B software, was putting that off as, as long as he could. He his thought was, "We'll get it working, and then we'll get somebody to come in and pretty it up." Uh, but you know, I'm looking at when are we going to start selling this? I'm thinking we're missing an opportunity here because we've already got the the timekeeping part working. We ought to put roll this out in increments, you yeah. know, with the modules and let people sign up for what they want. Couldn't get that that sold until we had the invoicing also in the the can, and the, I mean it was like approaching the horizon. Every month it looked like we were another month away. You know, sounds like a nightmare months. architecture project. Yeah, really. Yeah, right, Rick, right. Have, have you read uh, Have you read the Lean Startup by Eric Reese? No. Okay. The links. Uh, it's called the Lean Startup. Oh, the Lean. And Startup. I was yeah, the Lean Startup. Since that- since you mentioned Thirty Seven Signals, and um, you know they have a couple great books out there like Rework, right. and I was thinking you might have come across that. It's sort of the bible for software developers in terms of how to build a software application. Yeah, I'll take a look at that, but I, I have not. I've heard of the lean, whole lean development idea, but yeah, it's based right. on that idea. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So you you spent. So I, I can I get. I'm getting a visual picture here of what this was like. Right. Some frustration, you know, with the insertion point, trying to get these uh, <laughs> these invoices to look correct. So eventually, you know, it's hard. It's hard, Rick, to look at something that we've invested so much time in doing. And walk away and say, you know what, I'm I'm just I'm done with it. I'm going to say no. How did you do that? How did you come to that point where, you know what, I'm not going to spend any more time on this. I'm going to move on. Well, it was it had been, you know, frustrating for a while. Um, another thing that led up to that was that as the programmer was developing this, and we could see what, how the program would work, I was called upon to debug that. So in other words, I would do things, and if it didn't work the way it needed to, I had to explain that. And the only way to really get that across to everybody and me to remember what it was was to take screenshots of it. And then I would mark it up 
and we'd sit in, at the coffee house and go over all these things and, you know, say we would get it fixed by the next week. Sometimes we did that uh, uh, invoice template, you know, never did. So we were moving along like that. And again, always thought within a couple of months, we we're going to have this thing rolled out. And so I'm looking ahead to how do you onboard people? How are we going to do all of that? And one of the things I realized was that our website was, was pretty static. I mean, it was just, I was writing a few blog articles and posting them there. But beyond that, it was, it was pretty much static. But it was going to have to change as we got ready to roll it out. And also, I could see as we rolled it out, even under a, a beta test type thing, that people would be giving you feedback and tell you that both on the program and on your website, saying, you know, this doesn't work when you go to, you know, uh, get sign up for the trial. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. So I was explaining that we needed to get something that I could handle to do that because I, we're not going to have time for me to write up the problem and send it to Chris and Chris find time to deal with it. And a week later, we finally fixed that. I mean, it needs to be fixed within the hour. And uh, my website is built with Weebly. Weebly's got its pros and cons, but by and large, it's, it, the beauty of it is, is that it's, it's a drag and drop world and it's, it's unbelievably simple. The program we had was Word, uh, WordPress, our website. And there's nothing wrong with WordPress, but in our infinite wisdom, we had hired somebody to set up a totally custom um, uh, utilization of WordPress. So I'm writing a blog and I can't change the point size of the text. I can't do it. There's, you know, I don't know how to go in and change all that. So I was explaining that I could recreate this website in a week. And I, my initial the feedback was no. So I went ahead and did it anyway. I, I redid uh, the two pages that we had and came up with a third page. And his concern was that I, I was going to mess it all up and, and, and it wouldn't be what, what he wanted it to be. I came in one day and there, there it is. You know, I've, this is what it's going to look like, just like what you've got. I've redone this in Weebly. So I, I'd mentioned his, his uh, concerns about ownership. So he says, okay, I see your point. You know, I don't have any worries about you going ahead and doing this. So let's do that. Now, what I want you to do is explain to me how I'm going to own that. And uh, I said, well, it's set up on my account. I don't know. Maybe I can move it to your account and we could do it that way. And he says, well, we're going to have to do something like that. And I said, you know, this just seems like, you know, we're, we're, we don't have anything yet. Why are we worried about this? I mean, I don't even have a word written anywhere of what my deal is here, what I'm going to get out of all this. This is a year into it. And uh, so he says, okay, instead of me owning it right now, you go out and write up uh, what's going to happen if you don't turn it over to me, when you'll turn it over and what happens to you if you don't. And I went to a different coffee house on the way home. And uh, in an hour, I had that saying exactly what I wanted. And I read through it and I said, you know what? <laughs> Life's too short. I don't need this baloney. You know, so I called him up and said, hey, have you got time tomorrow to meet? And he says, yeah, I, I, could, I could meet. So we met, we met again. And he sat down with his, his coffee and I said, I'm walking away. I'm, I'm, it's just not working for me. And he's, he had a software company that he sold. So he's got some money. He does in, uh, angel investment type stuff, part of a group like that in, in Cincinnati. And he said, you know, I'm not going to try and talk you out of this. He says, we're, you know, way down the road and all that. But he says, one of the things the two of us have enjoyed is not having to do what we don't want to do. You know, he says, I work for myself. I develop products. You know, this was one of them. But if you don't, if it's not fun for you to do it, then, 
you know, I, I, I don't like it, but I, I understand what you're saying. And the problem was just going to be, it was just going to be like this every step of the way. I couldn't get him to put anything in writing that would protect me, and yet he was all about protecting himself. And that was just going to go on forever. In the meantime, I have no clue as to whether architects would let go of their systems. I mean, I really had identified that that was probably the biggest hurdle, is that, yeah, our accounting bookkeeping is a total mess. We hate it, but we understand it. And we don't know what we're getting into. Now, it wouldn't have been a giant investment to, to go to with the Corbu uh, system, but, uh, you know, still, you know, I don't know. There's, there's things that I don't do that I ought to do, and it's, and it's easy, and it's, you know, it makes sense for me to do it, but I just don't get around to doing it, so. Yeah. So, well, it sounds like, it sounds like the reaction from this guy who was a partner in words, you know, it hastened your exit, made it easy for you to say, you know what, this is just not going to work out. You saw the writing on the wall. Exactly. So you said goodbye to Corbu and, you know, you learned a lot through that process. Now you have you're devoting more time and effort to Architect Wiki. Right. So tell us about that project, Rick. What is Architect Wiki? Well, it's, it's just a blog, you know, written by an architect, me. Uh, I'm basically trying to think about what other young architects that might want to have their own firm would want to know about or need to know about and write about those things. Uh, this year I've hit on a different thing. You know, we, we've got a ton of projects and, and the vast majority of them were done in CAD. So there's digital uh, draw, uh, files there and I've begun pulling those together and I'm, if, if you're a subscriber, you know, they, they will be available to you to download as a AutoCAD files, you know, zip to get zipped up and there you go. Um, with a big disclaimer that, you know, you're over 21, don't, don't use this stuff without thinking about it. So, uh, you know, make, make use of it as best you can. That, that's just started. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of enthusiastic about that. That's away from the management and the finance side. I've spent a fair amount of time uh, describing how you can make uh, Harvest work for you. And I chose Harvest over uh, Fresh Books, mostly because if you're not wildly fussy about your invoicing, you can get at least hourly type invoices out of uh, Harvest with a couple of clicks. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been working on them and encouraging other people to work on them to clean. They've got a way to do a, like a, a fixed fee uh, invoice, but it's a mess. I mean, it, it, is, it is really a mess. The process you have to go through, it's just not worth it. And, and we never had all uh, hourly rate invoices. I mean, there was always some fixed fee type things or percentage of construction costs. So, you know, to some extent, you'll have to do some of those with your Word or Excel template, uh, even if you were to go on board with the Harvest. The beauty of Harvest and, and fresh books, but I'm a little partial, like I said, to Harvest, is that when you use it for your timekeeping, you know, it, 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 it's only costs around 10 or $11, depending on how many people you've got per person that's using it. Well, you know, if you run the math out, you're going to save enough money to pay for that, just to do that. And so some of my articles are about how you can make it work for you to do other kind of bookkeeping. You know, how you can capture all of your numbers, so to speak, in one place so that you've got something to hand to your accountant periodically and say, so what's our um, balance sheet look like or what does our income statement look like? I mean, some, we, we did those ourselves and our bank was always happy with that. I would always recommend that you not use a bank, but, you know, try and squirrel enough money away that you can self fund anything. But if you, if you are using a bank and, you know, you're going to need to turn in balance sheets and income statements at least once a year, maybe more frequently nowadays since there's been such a debacle with, with banking. 
So that's that's one of the things that I'm doing. The other thing that I've I've done through you know thinking about this is realize that lots of firms. I mean, again, 93% of the architectural firms in the U.S. are less than 10 people. So that's the size firm that I've always been in. I've only been in about three, but they were all less than 10 people. And how many of those firms that I experienced, including the one that I ran for 30 some years, had really good project management? None. And so I've hit on project management is another issue that architects probably struggle with. And it has to do with complexity and stuff. And the tool that I've found for that is Trello. And uh, Trello is free, which is makes it beautiful. And uh, I've been working on a bunch of articles that explain how you can make Trello work for you. In fact, I've got a an ebook in the in the uh, pipeline that hopefully will come out in the next month or so that you know puts it all together in, in a concise format with some checklists and stuff, so that anybody from even a one man firm could use this to to do a better job of of uh, uh, project management. I mean, my experience is that the senior people in the firm, for instance, my mentor that, that I had when I first got out of college, he did a great job of project management. He was older, but he also really knew what the heck he was doing, and he did a great job. I was you know, about 15 years younger and green, and my jobs didn't run as well as his did. I didn't have as many. We, we our, The uh, culture in the firm was thou shalt not make mistakes. So it wasn't that the drawings went out screwed up. It was that it took me forever to figure out how to do it so that it wasn't screwed up because I didn't have his experience. And sometimes he wouldn't tell me the answer. He would say, you're over 21. Figure it out for yourself. It'll do you some good. So... Sounds like you know, a good mentor. On the, on the one hand, I've got somebody, you know, nipping at my heels to get this thing turned out, you know, wrapped up. And on the other hand, I'm getting somebody that knows how to do it that won't tell me. So after a couple of days, I usually got, got some feedback. Just, just to finish up here, what would you say are your top three uh, project management tips for doing project management better as architects? First would be that you need a, uh, a an actual system that you've, Put together somehow. Um, you may have found, you know, an AIA checklist that you've uh, edited and made your own, but that you go through that every on every project. And um, and because once you do that, you know, you've created something that's shareable. Yeah. Now that green guy in the firm can make sure that he doesn't have omissions and that he's doing everything in a logical sequence instead of whatever comes to mind. I mean, I've, I've had times when, you know, we're out there, we're doing, you know, color selection, and we're not even out of schematic design yet because the client has asked for that. And with what I know now and what I knew, you know, years later, is that you have to learn how to say, no, there's a time and, and place for that, and I know you're really interested in it right now, but we will do that only be, if you pay extra to have it done now, because I can guarantee you it won't be any good by the time we get there. Mm -hmm. And now it'll be a fight as to why we need to do it all over again. Colors in particular are terrible. I have a, one of my posts is about uh, a process I dreamt up on how to, to do colors, starting with getting almost in writing, who's going to approve the colors? <laughs> As you can imagine, there's just nightmares about that. Everybody gets seems to get a say in it, and, and supposedly has some some knowledge about it. And you know, I'm fine with it's not me that's doing the colors, but let's get that straightened out up front. As far as the the management, though, I would say the uh, the other thing that you need to do is to make it something that to go to that checklist or to go to that process needs to be really easy. You know, it's got to be sitting on your desktop, you know, as a, a tab on your browser or something that, that you can uh, get to really quickly to double check things. And it, it, 
probably the other thing it needs to do is be a place that you can, I don't, I don't know if I would say communicate so much as log in issues and, and problems. And, uh, you know, whether, whether that goes to someone else and, and it's like a communication tool or not, I don't think that's as important as logging in that this has come up and what are we going to do about it kind of a thing so that you have that on, you know, on your plate in front of you, that that's got to get resolved. Mm -hmm. And and maybe, I don't know if I'm on, I've done three yet, but the other thing is, is that you need to advance through that, you know, in a logical sequence. And maybe if you've got it written down, that becomes kind of a given. But I know that in my career, we would sometimes be in the midst of one, one phase of a project and have somebody that needs work. And so we get them started on the door schedule or something that we weren't planning to do for another month or so. And sometimes you, you know, that works out. And sometimes you get down the road and find out that, oh yeah, we decided to use a different size door and you have to go back and change all the door sizes. Something you didn't think was possible becomes possible because you're doing it out of sequence. So it needs to be something that builds on itself as you go forward. Getting back to the 37 Signals book rework, I mean, they point out that, you know, not having to do rework is the key to it. Um, back in the 80s, uh, Deming was the guru about, you know, how you make a well-run company and, and all of that. And I read one of the books that he wrote, and it basically was, discovering how to do something so that you don't have to redo it. I mean, mm -hmm. eliminate rework. Yeah. But you know, in manufacturing, it was common to have tons of parts mismanufactured sitting over there. And, and you know, you might have a hundred of them before you bothered to stop the line and figure out what's going wrong. Just going to keep cranking them out. He says, yeah, you, you got to stop the line right this minute. That's, that's even something that was kind of like on the news that, Ford or somebody had set up the possibility to stop the line. And they did that because they found out that Toyota did it. So anyway, so you, you need to do things in a logical order because going back and reworking is a killer. You need to make your decisions and have them all build on one another and just keep going. That doesn't mean that the design is affected. It's, it basically just saves you a lot of aggravation. When you had your firm, Rick, is that something that you had that you used were checklists for the project management? We, yeah, it was a rudimentary form of what we're doing now. It was much shorter. What we had discovered is that we were having, on virtually every job, there was always some sort of big delay, something that was taking us forever. And we, we didn't know what the heck they were. So we started having these lunchtime meetings to sit down and debug different jobs and what, what was messing things up. Um, either giving us a black eye with the client or we were just spinning our wheels. And, and at the end of the day, we ended up having to turn around and do something different after having done the wrong thing first and not be able to get compensated for it. We came up with um, probably 20 things that needed to happen in, in a particular sequence and if they didn't, and some of them were things that we always tagged on at the end, but they really needed to be happening at the end of schematic design. Once we knew where we were going, things like uh, uh, getting some sort of preliminary okay about a, a right of way uh, easement or uh, what I'm trying to say is you're going to have a curb cut. You know, are you going to be able to get a curb cut where that, where you want the curb cut? Or is it going to have to be at the other end of the site? It's at the other end of the site. It's, going to have to do, redo the site plan at some point. So we started finding out there's a number of things like that. Some were just uh, approvals that needed to get started way in advance of when we typically did it, uh, even though they all said they wanted fin final drawings. I mean, that just wasn't real world stuff, mm -hmm, particularly yep. private clients aren't willing to wait two or three months for the bureaucrats to review those things. So we would submit them as soon as they looked complete enough. That, I mean, that was the line checkers love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always that battle. Yeah. So, you know, those are, those are the things. Well, we, we did that with, you know, coming up with that checklist of about 20 items. 
what phase they happened in, what sequence, and all those kinds of things. We had a check check sheet to check them off as you did them. And then we pat ourselves on the back, and we didn't take it the next step and, and really develop that into to something more. That's that's where we, we we thought we had done the TQM thing and, you know, mastered it and, and should have just kept that, that weekly meeting going forever. Oh, what would have been the next step to take that further? To, to uh, work out how not just these three things need to happen in this phase, in this sequence, but what else needs to happen in the phase? We were, again, assuming that everybody knew that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it so you're just... you're talking about documenting it, making sure it's very clear. Yeah, documenting it, doing the documents in, in some sort of not going too far or what's even worse is to go past something and, and leave it hanging there because you don't think it's going to be a big deal and you don't know. I, I don't know if I can remember them now, but I came up with like four rules. One was to start with the stuff that other people are waiting on, like your engineers, etc. Second thing was to do all the stuff you don't know the answer to. Uh, the next one was to do all the hard stuff. You, you know about it, but it's, it's, you know, pain to do it. Do it third. And the last thing was do all the easy stuff. Put the title blocks on it and all that stuff at the end of the job. Yeah, the, yeah. That, That's not going to keep you from going out for bids on time, but some of those other things will. Good point about prioritization. So, yeah. well, thanks for that, Rick. So basically, just to summarize what I picked up there was you talked about, look, you need to have some sort of checklist, some sort of process. You need right. to follow that sequentially. You need to make it easy for your staff and for yourself to get in there and be able to put notes about what's not working and collaborate on that. And yeah. then you just need to follow it. Right. Exactly. Great. And so that's that's been the focus, one of the big focuses of Architect Wiki lately. Yeah. I've done a couple of uh, like uh, generic projects in Trello that uh, I've posted as public boards so that people can see what I'm talking about and, and use it if they want. So that's... Yep. Well, I, I invite all our listeners to go check out Architect Wiki. Uh, it does have a lot of very interesting articles on there. You're putting up some great content, Rick. So congratulations on that. And the website is architectwiki.com and architect is spelled... A R C H I T E K. So architectwiki.com. If you search that on Google, you know, Architect Wiki, it'll come up. And Rick, thanks for joining us today on Business of Architecture. My pleasure. Thank you. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.